Hello, everyone. Um, to get started, I would like to address the title of this talk, From Tragedy to Triumph. Uh, it's a big one. It's a very big one. So what does it mean, and why am I qualified to tell you about it? Pictured here is my family, myself, my dad, Craig, my brother, Logan, and my mother, Melanie. As you can tell, we're a pretty happy family. Part of that is because we're at the beach. Um, but part of that is also because my family was what you could call a normal suburban family that lived in Blairstown, New Jersey. My mother was a successful clinical trials nurse who loved her job and came into work every day fighting to find the cure for cancer. And my father, a plasterer who frequently worked in New York City, spent 52 weeks a year, six days a week, providing for his family. This meant that we had a pretty comfortable existence. We had a nice house, great friends, and I enjoyed my life in Blairstown. But one, time, one day, all these things changed. During a routine MRI, my mother was diagnosed with late stage lung cancer. A woman under the age of 45 who practiced what she preached, to say it simply, lived a healthy lifestyle and frequently went for medical tests for her jobs. The chances of her being, di being diagnosed with stage four lung cancer at a late stage were astronomically low. Also, the chances that she would have no symptoms up to stage four of this really aggressive disease were even lower. Now, my, my family life very, very quickly changed. Uh, I went from a kid who spent his entire life living as normal as one could be. My mom would wake me up in the morning, uh, my dad would be at work, and I would get ready for school and live my life like blissfully unaware of the realities, the harsh realities of the world. But that had to change very quickly. I was diagnosed when I was eight years old. It was 2008. And from that moment on, it became my responsibility to take care of my mother. And the way I saw it, the way that I needed to look at things is it, it became my sole responsibility to ensure that she had everything she needed. I woke up every day, made her two Pop-Tarts, a chocolate milkshake, and divided her 47 medications for the day. I became extremely obsessive compulsive because I needed to control everything. If I missed anything, I would be afraid that everything was over. And what this meant is that I started trying to control everything in my life, things that I couldn't possibly control, and it resulted in very violent outbursts of emotion, anger, uncontrollable bursts of laughter, and most importantly, fear. Fear which can be summed up pretty easily by an irrational fear that I had. So all of us who sit in a classroom knows that in the corner sits this ugly beige telephone that rings barely ever. But every time it would ring, everyone in the classroom would get really excited. You could see everyone perk up from whatever dazed and unaware state they were sitting in because this meant that somebody was going home. Everyone got very excited. But for me, this meant that the most important person in my life could have died. So I started shaking. Um, I was terrified of this phone. I never wanted to hear it ring. And this really summed up my experience for four years. Uh, and then one day, that phone did ring. Um, she passed away in, on December 12th, 2012, and I was 12 years old. I was in sixth grade. And what this meant that my only purpose for the last four years, what I had spent my entire childhood getting good at doing, being her caretaker, my sense of purpose disappeared. And it disappeared quickly. It was ripped away from me. And the loss of my mother almost wasn't as profound as the loss of my purpose. When you spend four years of your life learning how to do something well, one thing well, and it's taken away from you, much less losing your ability to cope with that, it can change some things pretty quickly. And, and, and what this meant for me was that I became distanced, unaware. Uh, I began to fall behind in school. I started treating people with disrespect, and I lost contact of who I was as a person. Uh, come middle school, the unbelievable wave of time had taken away some of the pain, and I started regaining some of this focus, but the sense of hopelessness was still there. So this is one of my favorite quotes. It's from Frederick Douglass, who hopefully everyone here knows. Without a struggle, there can be no progress. And throughout this stage in my life in middle school, there were various people that saw something in me that I still don't see in myself. They saw a person who had the possibility to be something more. And with themselves, as I moved on to high school, I made a change. And I vowed that I would no longer spend my time wasting away and wallowing in the unfortunate circumstances of my family. I vowed that I no longer would be wasting my time being the person that no one deserved. I didn't deserve it, 
The people that I, interact with, I interacted with didn't deserve it. And when I came to high school, I knew I needed to do something differently. From that, the Melanie Humphrey Breath of Life Fund was born. The Melanie Humphrey Breath of Life Fund is a fund designed to help make the lives of lung cancer patients and their families easier. It's operated in conjunction with the Pocono Health Foundation at the hospital where my mom used to work. So every day when I go and work with these people, I get to come in and do what my mom did. Now, imagining this, it's very, very therapeutic, but the fund provides small monetary grants to lung cancer patients and their families with the help of the social workers who determine financial need. And it's allowed me to change the lives of 21 families in the last three years. 21 families who without this kind of help would go without their treatments, without medications, without food, without school supplies for their children, and even in instances without heat. How can you possibly fight cancer if you don't have heat in your house? This, these funds have been supported, over $70,000 raised, by an annual 5K hosted on Blair Academy's cross country course. And in this 5K, we've had over 900 runners come and run in the last three years from a far, as far away from Florida. And it's given me an opportunity to not only see what I'm capable of, but to see what a community of people who is organized towards one goal are capable of. It's also given me the opportunity to speak at awareness events and go through things that I never would have exposed myself to. If you told me three years ago that I would be standing on this stage, talking to all of you, or standing on any stage for that matter, and talking about the things that I shoved down because they were too painful to realize, I would have laughed in your face. Uh, because that, that's unimaginable. Now, you've all heard my story, but it's important to realize that hardship comes in all shapes and sizes. It is true that I went through an extremely traumatic event, but hardship can be anything. Uh, the stresses of getting into college, the everyday stresses you face with relationships with friends and family, the stresses that you might face by walking up a big flight of stairs, they're all hardship. And we all have the power to combat these things. This is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And for those of you who are not psychology students, Maslow was an American psychologist born in the early 20th century. The hierarchy of needs is a, a pyramid that, sort of, that organizes psychological health. We must fulfill one level before reaching the other. So once our basic needs for food are met, we can move on to being able to give and receive love, self-esteem, and then at the very top of that is self-actualization. And self-actualization is the stage in which a person is able to reach their full potential. Now, later in his life, Maslow theorized that once somebody reaches this point of self-actualization, self they can actually hit a point of self-transcendence. And this means that a person who has been focusing on bettering themselves can now focus their energies outwards on helping other people. And this is the stage that everyone, hopefully, can reach by the end of this. So I organized eight steps to success, eight steps that helped me along the way to create the difference that I have, but also to hopefully help some other people make that difference. So number one is fulfill your basic needs first. It's pretty uh, basic that you need to fulfill your needs for food and water, but also to fulfill these needs for belonging, for self-esteem, these are essential. You have to love yourself before you can love someone else. Number three, find your village. I mentioned the people that had helped me in my life before. None of this can be accomplished, nothing can be accomplished without a huge number of people who are helping you, your friends, your family, your mentors. Find the people in your life who are gonna help you along this path. And then number four, set an ambitious yet achievable goal. Don't have to underestimate yourself. Far too many people set their sights low because they think I can't possibly do this, I can't achieve these things. And they, they sell themselves short. They don't accomplish great things because they don't plan on accomplishing great things. And that is a disgrace to what everyone in this room is ca uh, capable of. But also, don't set your sights too high. Unachievable goals are detrimental to the person trying to achieve them, and you, you really can't get anywhere with it. And then number five, answer the three Ws. So why have I chosen to work towards this goal? What do I hope to gain from this experience? This is possibly the most important thing. Gaining something from an experience does not mean that you gain something from the end result. You gain something from the process. The process is the most important part. And then the third, why, what am I hoping to gain, like I mentioned. Uh, and then six, take action. If you spend all of your time in the planning stages of these things and you don't actually get up, dust yourself off, and begin to make small changes, little differences, then you can't accomplish anything and then seven, persist. It's inevitable that at some point during this, we will all face new hardships. 
we will all face things that will make us want to give up. But your ability to dust yourselves off, get back up, when the going gets tough, you must all get tougher, is what's going to determine how successful you are. And then eight, once you've accomplished your goal, you must reflect on what you've accomplished. If you move on to the next thing, without realizing what you've just done, you don't gain anything from the experience. Uh, as I end this, I want to make sure that everyone in this room knows what they're capable of. If you underestimate yourself, you, you can never achieve this point of confidence, this point of, of, of helping other people. And every single person in this room is capable of that. Thank you.